Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome to another Rust WebAssembly tutorial. Today we're going to be building a snake game using Rust and WebAssembly. Now I know we already built a snake game in Rust in a previous project. However, the major difference here is that we're going to be using HTML canvas to render out our snake and the elements for the board and everything rather than using a renderer. To get started, we want to, of course, import standard web. Inside of the cargo.toml file, we'll write standard web, and the current version at the time of this recording is 0.4.7. With that imported, we want to create a static folder so that we can have our index.html inside of it. And let's actually create the index.html so that we know what our application output will look like. Here we have the index.html body. I've just generated this with Emmet. And all we have here is a title that says Wasm Snake. And then inside of the body, we just want to create a canvas with a special ID so that we can actually grab it from our WebAssembly code. And then of course we want to link in the script. Our canvas will have an ID of canvas and I'll give it a width and height of 800. And then the script tag will have a source that points towards the JavaScript file that will be generated. And we want it to be the name of the project, which in my case is wasm underscore snake .js. So if you have a different name, say you just called your project snake, just write in snake .js. For this tutorial, we are going to be splitting the project into two different videos. In this video, we're going to be focusing on the utility functions and the main canvas renderer for our application. So inside of the main.rs file here, we want to bring in the external crate for standard web, and we want to annotate it with an attribute for the macro use so that we can use the macros inside of our application. Then we want to create a sub module and I'm just going to call this file canvas mod canvas and then create of course canvas.rs inside of the source folder. While we're inside of the main.rs file let's also create a sub module called direction. This will handle most of the controls and stuff for our application. So just create a direction.rs file and then of course inside of main.rs add mod direction. Let's actually start with our direction sub module by creating a public enum that contains all of the four directions that we want to allow our snake to move in. We have up, down, left, and right and we need to derive debug, partial equality, copy, and clone on this enum. And we'll see why we're doing this at some point later, probably in the next video. We also want to create an implementation block for direction so that we can define a method which will allow us to determine if one of the directions is opposite from another one. And we're doing this because we don't want the user to have the ability to move the snake in an opposite direction because this would automatically cause a fail state. This method will be called opposite. It will take in self, which is our direction, and then it will also take in another direction, which we'll call other, and it will output a Boolean. And then we just want to define a large Boolean expression, which will come back either true or false based on whether or not self is opposite from the other direction. So here we have self being direction up, and if self is direction up, and other is direction down, then this will return true. Then we'll say if self is, say, direction down, and other is direction up, then of course we'll get back true. We just want to finish this expression by adding the four different possibilities. So self can be up, and if other is down, then that is opposite, and if self is down and other is up, then those are opposite, and then of course we have left and right, and then right and left. And we can combine all of these expressions with these simple or Boolean statements so that we get back true if we have opposites and we get back false if we do not have opposites. Now with the direction module written, let's go into the canvas module and make the imports that we're going to need to render all of our elements onto the canvas. Inside of our canvas module, we want to bring in standard web traits and we'll bring in all of the traits in a glob import. Then we need to bring in the try into type 
from the unstable namespace inside of standard web. And then we also need the canvas element, which is inside of standard web, HTML element, canvas element. And then of course, we also need the document object and the canvas rendering context 2D type, which comes from the standard web namespace. Once we've got these imports, we can start to define the canvas object or structure. So our canvas object will have a public canvas item which will just be the canvas element that it's bound to. We also want to make the context of this canvas element public as well. So we'll create a public field called CTX and its type will be canvas rendering context 2D. To finish off this structure, we need to create four more fields. We need to create a scaled width and height, and then we want to create a normal width and height. So the scale width and height will be based on the actual resolution of the canvas. This means that they can change as we increase or decrease the resolution of the canvas itself. So because the canvas has a built-in resolution, we want to make it so that our items scale upwards and downwards if we make this larger. Then the normal width and height are just the absolute numbers that we're using to create these widths and these heights for our canvas elements. Now let's create the implementation block so that we can attach a few methods to this structure. Our first method will be a new method. And what we'll do with this method is get the canvas from our HTML using this atter ID string. And then we'll take in the width and the height, which will allow us to define the initial state of our canvas element. This method is public, of course, and it takes in the attribute ID, the width, the height, and then it outputs a new canvas element. Let's start out by actually getting the canvas element. So we'll create a new variable, which we'll call canvas, and it will have a type of canvas element. We'll ping the document object, and we'll use query selector where we pass in the adder ID, which we're passing into the new method. We need to then unwrap this item from a result, which we get back. And then we need to unwrap it yet again from a option. And then finally, we want to call the try into method on top of this so that we can attempt to cast the item that we're getting back as a canvas element. And of course, we need to unwrap that from the option which we get back. It's pretty common to see this type of pattern where you have some type of query selector or DOM manipulation, and you're bringing in an item, and then you want to use this try into method to try to cast that item as the type that you're saying it should be. Now that we have the canvas, we can get the context. So we'll create a variable called CTX and its type will be canvas rendering context 2D. We just call canvas dot get context and then we want to unwrap this from the result. Now we can get our scaled width and height and we do this simply by getting the width of the canvas and dividing it by the width that we're pushing into this method. And we do the same with the height. And then finally, we can return a new struct of canvas type with our canvas variable in for the canvas field, the context variable in for the context, and the scaled width and height in for the scaled width and height, and of course, our width and height in for the width and height. And because they're all named the same, we can use the syntactic sugar rather than having to use an equal sign to set all of them into their respective fields. Now that we've built our new method, let's create a draw method. So this takes in the canvas object that we've already set up with our new method. And then it allows us to apply a color to it as well as define where the actual element should be relative to our canvas. So we're passing through an X and a Y coordinate and then we're passing through the color that we want to color this particular item. And we'll use this draw function to draw out the actual snake itself. 
as well as the apple. We want to verify that X and Y are inside of our canvas, and we can do this by using assert macros. So we can say assert that X is less than self.width and assert that Y is less than self.height. And if one of these Boolean values comes back as false, then we'll get an error. After we make these assertions, we can then fill the context with our color. So we just call self context fill style color and then pass in the slice of string that we've passed into this method. After getting the color and calling our set fill style, we want to rescale X and Y with our scaled width and height respectively. And we can do this simply by multiplying the X that we're passing into here with the scaled width and then the Y with the scaled height. Now notice that we're using the same variable name inside of this function for each of the variables. So we're saying let x equal x times self.scaled width and let y equal y times self.scaled height. Now despite the fact that x and y are immutable variables, this still works. And the reason it works is because of what's called variable shadowing. This is something I never touched on in the intro to Rust tutorials. Now variable shadowing allows us to use the same name for a variable, but what it does is it allows us to replace the variable that we're renaming inside of the scope with a new variable. So rather than mutating X and Y, we're actually creating a new X and Y and past these lines Every single time that we refer to X and Y, we're now referring to these new X and Y values. Now that we've scaled X and Y, we can call self.ctx.fill rectangle, and this will allow us to then apply the color which we set into the fill style to the rectangle that we want to color. So if we have our snake, then we want to apply this color to the head and to the tail, and if we have our apple, then we want to apply the color to the simple square that is the apple. Now you'll notice that we're getting errors here, and that is because this function expects floating 64 types rather than U32s. So we need to cast all of our values as F64. The first two values that we want to pass in here are X and Y, and then we're going to pass in the scaled width and the scaled height. And we can surround each of these items with an F64 from call, which will then try to convert the U64 number into an F64 type. With our draw method now complete, let's create a method which we'll call clear all, which will allow us to completely wipe the canvas clean every single time we call it. Now the reason we want this clear off method is so that we can completely clear the canvas every single time the snake moves. If we were to leave it alone, as it currently is, when the snake moves, it would just continually grow and grow and grow. But instead, what we can do is set a specific time period, which will be our quote unquote frames per second, which will then allow us to completely clear the screen every single time our snake moves forward. So naturally, we want to set the fill style color for the entire canvas, which we'll set as white. After we've set the white into the fill style, we want to apply it to the entire canvas. So X and Y will start at the origin, which is 0.0, .0 and 0.0. .0. And then our width and our height will be our self.width times our self.scaled width, and then our self.height times our self.scaled height so that it reaches the entire canvas. Now remember, inside of our new method, we're passing in a width and a height which gets attached to each of our canvas objects. And the scaled width and the scaled height are derived from dividing the canvas width, which is the actual width tied to the canvas, and the canvas height, again, which is tied to the canvas, by this width and height. So we reverse that by multiplying the width times the scaled width and the height times the scaled height, which then gives us the canvas width and the canvas height down here in our clear all method. 
If we wanted to, we could also write it like this, where we're just calling self.canvas.width, which we get the entire width of our canvas as it's embedded inside of the object. However, the other way is a little bit more general, and I kind of like it a little bit better. Now that we've completed the canvas and direction modules, we can actually test the functionality of our canvas module if we want to. Let's go back into our main.rs file and let's set up standard web so that it will work properly. Inside of the main function, we want to call standard web initialize at the top and then we want to call standard web event loop at the bottom. We also want to import our canvas element from the canvas module. And now we can say let canvas equal canvas new. We put in the attribute, which is the ID of the canvas so that we can grab it from the HTML. And then we want to put in the width and the height, which if you remember gets divided by the actual width and the height of the canvas to create this scaled width and height. So if we put in 20 by 20, it divides the 800 by 800 by 20 which gives us 40 different sectors inside of our actual canvas to work with. Now after we've grabbed the canvas, we can go ahead and draw a bunch of squares if we want, and then position them based on the X and Y coordinates that we're putting in here. So if we put in five by five, then it will be scaled based on the resolution of the canvas, and it will be at position five by five. And then we have 10 by 10 and 15 by 10. And we put in the different colors here. So we'll have a red, orange, and blue square in various different positions on our canvas. Let's go into our terminal and let's use the cargo web tool to actually serve our application and attach it to the static HTML that we put inside of the static folder. Now this is something I didn't show you guys last time, but you can call cargo web start pass in the target that you want to target, and this will then spin up a server which will automatically get anything that's inside of a folder called static and attach it to the application. There's a little bit of text that explains how this works. So it says here, if you need to serve any extra files, put them into a static directory in the root of your crate they will be served alongside your application. You can also put a static directory in your source directory if you want to. And then it says here, your application is being served at wasm underscore snake dot javascript, and it will be automatically rebuilt if you make any changes to your code. So this allows us to add items dynamically and then see what happens inside of our browser. By default, this will serve your application at localhost 8000, and you can see here, we have get our red square, our orange square, and then our blue square. And if we want to, say, add a purple square, rather than having to go into the terminal and stop the server, we can just type in canvas.draw, pass in the coordinates that we want this square to appear at, and then pass in the color purple. And then we can come back into our browser and reload the page and you'll see now the changes actually occur. So we now have this purple square sitting here. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.